one of the things that I want to talk about a little bit is the connection between Columbia and more specifically Teachers College and IBM. Uh, as Rodella mentioned, uh, I went to TC and I'm an adjunct there now. Uh, Mike, he is finishing his degree actually this month at, at TC. And uh, if you're wondering why we're having the event in July, it's because he's doing a, a distance program, but every July he has to come in to New York. He's uh, based out of Cincinnati. So we said, well, we should probably have the event in July to, to uh, showcase all this. So that's, um, that's why we have that. And uh, there's a lot of, uh, a few other teachers college alum who we work with at IBM. There's also a couple of interns there uh, as well. So it's a pretty strong connection between the TC community and IBM. And uh, we hope it'll continue to stay strong and, and get stronger in that way. Uh, so just a quick show of hands. Have you heard of this term, analytics? And do you think you, or, do you know what it is? I don't really know what it is. I'm sort of working in the area, but uh, Mike will give us some uh, and uh, before I hand it over to him, I just want to talk a little bit about some of the things that we will and uh, will focus a little bit more on, and uh, just to make sure that we're all kind of uh, in the same area. Uh, so our group, we work internally for IBM. So IBM has around 400 plus thousand employees. So everything that you're gonna see and that we show and we talk about, the audience is really other IBM employees. And so again, that's still a lot of people, but uh, all of our work happens internally, and we don't necessarily do uh, work with uh, external clients. And so the reason why I mention that is a lot of, probably all of what you'll see here today, you'll probably never see again, for better or worse, because it all just tends to stay internal. So, um, and then uh, another thing that we'll be looking at is more about the demand of learning. And so we're not really gonna be talking about evaluations that happen, say, within a class or after a class, and what we do with those. But we're talking a little bit higher level on the demand of learning that we see and the type of data that we can get and what we can do with that data to make more informed business and educational decisions. So, uh, but the good news is, is actually quick show of hands, how many of us are working not in a school environment but in an organizational or corporate environment? Okay, so about 75%. So, so for those of you who may be more in a school-based environment, uh, there will still be some things that you will see here today that will translate over into some of the things that you do. So, uh, uh, so don't worry too much about that. And uh, a few more things. Uh, judging by the turnout from today, we think that this is a fairly uh, interesting and popular type of topic. So one thing that we're gonna try and do uh, with the Teachers College um, alumni relations is have more events like this, but geared towards a little bit different audience. So obviously today with IBM, this event is geared more towards the corporate crowd. But we have an event planned with Newton. We heard of Newton? Newton, uh, it's an uh, educational technology company in the fall, and they're gonna focus a little bit more on higher education. And then we also have one planned uh, upcoming, possibly in the spring for K-12. So, welcome everyone. It's great to see everyone have an interest in, uh, in learning analytics. So, like Nabil said, I'm gonna talk about some of the things that we've done internally with an idea. Um, but first, let's take a step back and discuss what we mean by analytics and why it's important. All right, so what are analytics? The definitions vary, but most of them circle around three key concepts. Analytics is about collecting, analyzing, and taking action on data. Note that it, um, data analysis is a key part of the story, but there's more to analytics than data analysis. It might seem obvious, but, we don't, if, but if we don't first collect the data, we can't do the analysis. Or worse, if we collect inaccurate data, no matter how brilliant our analysis may be, garbage in always leads to garbage out. And this is important because analytics is ultimately about taking action. The goal of analytics is to provide the insight we need to make smarter decisions based on fact rather than gut feeling or personal opinion. And smarter decisions lead to smarter outcomes. And that's a big deal. Don't take my word for it. In the past four years, IBM has invested over $14 billion in this space. We've acquired major analytics companies such as SPSS, Cognos, CoreMetrics, and Unica. We've also trained and hired thousands of consultants, software developers, and mathematicians. Um, analytics delivers unprecedented value to our customers, and that makes it a key growth play for IBM. All right, so let's take it down a few thousand. The IBM Learning Organization is responsible for the professional development and learning programs provided by IBM employees worldwide. 
Nabil and I both work for the IBM Center for Advanced Learning Technology Team, which is part of this larger IBM Learning Organization. As part of this team, I've helped design and lead many of the learning analytics projects I'm sharing with you this evening. So what kind of data are we talking about? For starters, IBM has over 430,000 employees. Needless to say, these employees consume a lot of learning. Just last year, our internal learning um, websites had over 70 million page views. IBMers spent 11.6 million hours on various learning activities, completing 3.9 million courses. Each year, IBM spends a half a billion dollars on IBM employee education and professional development. So what do we do about this? The totals shown on the previous slide are based on hundreds of millions of data points generated each year. So how do we begin to make sense of all this data? Strangely enough, the first and perhaps best answer to these questions comes from one of my favorite science fiction writers, Douglas Adams. Any of you guys heard of Douglas Adams or The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? All right, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. All right. So those of you who are, who are not familiar, um, here's the sage advice. And really, there is no need to panic. When it comes down to it, learning analytics is just like any other form of analytics. It's simply the use of analytics to make smarter learning decisions and to achieve smarter outcomes. Now, I think this begs a really interesting question. Why now? Learning institutions and analytical techniques have both been around for centuries. So why are we here discussing learning analytics in a crowded room on a Thursday night in the 21st century? Tuesday. Tuesday. <laughs> Tuesday. <laughs> and there's actually a nice short answer to this question. But I think the long answer is a lot more interesting. So let's take a little journey. <clears throat> Not to the desert. Through the four edges of sand. A few years ago, I stumbled across a speech that our good friend Douglas Adams gave to a group of scientists at Cambridge University. In his typical outrageous style, Adams claims that our modern world is largely a result of the various uses we found for sand. So the invention of the telescope ushered in the first use of sand. From sand we make glass, from glass we make lenses, and from lenses we can make a telescope. When early astronomers such as Galileo and Kepler turned their telescopes to the heavens, they found a universe that was astonishingly different from what they had expected to see. Needless to say, this all took a while to sink in. Over time, the people who embraced this new source of data revolutionized the world. For example, Kepler's precise astronomical observations leads to his discovery of the planetary laws of motion. This leads to Newton's laws of physics, which leads to modern engineering, and that, my friends, leads us to right here, where we are right now. The Manhattan skyscraper we're in right now exists because of the chain of analysis that was produced in modern engineering. The key point is that with the right analysis, a new source of data has the potential to yield powerful and entirely unexpected results. All right, so half a century after the invention of the telescope, we put glass lenses into microscopes, and once again, we entire encountered an entirely new and unexpected world. We discovered microorganisms, molecules, atoms, even DNA. And once again, the people who embraced this new source of data changed the world, this time revolutionizing sanitation, <coughs> medicine, biology, and chemistry. 300 years later, we get the third age of sand, the silicon transistor. With the modern computer, we can perform calculations and process data on a scale unimaginable when we were born. It's hard to believe that the first silicon transistor was created less than 60 years ago. But once again, the world has changed because of the people who embrace this new way of gathering, storing, and analyzing information. And so we come to the fourth age of sand. Fiber optic cable is made from a highly purified form of silica glass. And with this newfound use of sand, we get the internet. For the first time in human history, everyone in the world can now interact with everyone else. Even better, since this interaction happens on a computer, we now have a fundamentally new source of data. And this time, the data is not about plants or bacteria. 
<coughs> this time the data is about ourselves. It's about who we are, what we do, and even how we learn. So welcome to the fourth age of sand. We're living in an age with unprecedented opportunity to uncover new insights about how we learn and how we can make learning even better. And who knows where these insights will take us. This is why look, analytics is such a relevant topic in 2012. It's the fourth age of sand, and we're just getting started. All right. So what have we been doing in IBM Learning? We've been using analytics quite a bit on a number of projects, and we have quite a few others in the works. And I, and I have to add, we're not the only ones doing this. There's other groups also doing analytics projects, especially in the um, evaluation area. Um, but um, today we're going to talk about some of the projects we've specifically been working on. Um, you can imagine how it can be applied to other areas as well. So, uh, learning search analytics. Today we provide IBMers 32,000 distinct learning activities in our catalog. And this includes traditional formats such as classroom-based learning, online self-study, and live virtual classroom. It also includes non-traditional learning from a variety of sources such as online books, um, and our informal learning exchange. So with so much to choose from, how do we ensure IBMers find the best available learning for their particular need? Obviously, people can't benefit from good learning unless they can actually find it. And from a business perspective, IBM gets no return on its substantial learning investment unless its employees actually find and consume the right learning. So how do we improve learning search? The answer, of course, is through analytics. Step one is get the data. So we updated the learning search interface with an IBM Webmetrics uh, product called uh, Unica Net Insight. This made it possible to generate a number of interesting reports. We can now see what search terms IBMers are searching for. And for these search terms, we can see which uh, of the search results users are actually selecting. Um, we can also see search terms that return no results at all um, and uh, identify when users get search results but don't bother selecting any results. Um, even better, all of these reports can be generated for a specific country, for a specific business, use, business group, or job category. So with this new source of data, we can take action to improve learning search. For example, our search is for example, our search has a suggested match feature. Um, so using top search terms, we can ensure that there are good suggested matches for each of these top search terms. Another example. How many of you guys have heard of the acronym POSH? Yeah, we didn't either. Um, but apparently, a large number of IBMers were searching for learning about POSH, <coughs> and particularly in India. So it turns out POSH stands for Prevention of Sexual Harassment. Who knew? So we tagged some of our best learning on this topic with POSH and added a few suggested matches, and the problem went away. Um, we repeated this process on hundreds of other terms. The moral here is once we know about the problem, they're really easy to fix. But without the data, we don't even know the problem exists. We're also surprised to find that a large number of users are searching by the learning activity course code number. Don't ask us how they get it. They get it from some spreadsheet or somewhere. They go in, they search for it. But sometimes these search results uh, return um, no data because of a typo in the course number, because the learning activity expired and was no longer available. Um, so to address this, we implemented a Google-like type ahead feature um, on search. So as users type in, they immediately start getting results back, especially on course codes. Um, so this gave them the learning activity in just a few keys. It also included the expired course codes. And that way, <coughs> they could immediately realize that they weren't going to be able to find the learning activity, and they understood why. Um, as a result, the number of failed searches has dramatically reduced. Another cool thing we did is um, actually changed the order of search results so that the higher interest learning activities were more likely to appear at the top of the list. We did this by computing an overall interest score for each learning activity. We based this interest score on a number of criteria, including how new the learning activity is, 
how often this learning activity is selected from search results or recommendations, how often the um, people actually enroll in the learning activity, and how positively the users evaluate the learning after they take it. We then use this overall interest score to adjust the order of search results returned to the user. This made it much easier for users to find the high interest learning activities and avoid the ones that were not getting much traction. All right. Yeah, and so we were also able to use this interest score to provide IBMers popular learning recommendations based on a specific job role, country, and organization. All right, so learning demand. The learning profession has rightfully been focused on learning effectiveness for quite some time. But you don't hear many people talking about learning demand, which I believe can be just as important. If a learning activity covers an irrelevant or obsolete topic, it really doesn't matter how effective the learning teaches the topic. Employees simply won't take the learning, and so the learning provides no value to IBM or any other company or organization. So we created the Learning Demand Dashboard to help learning professionals begin to gauge the current demand of the learning activities they manage. For example, when a learning activity is about to expire, the Learning Demand Dashboard notifies users of this fact and provides a link to some of the key statistics to help them decide if they should let the learning activity expire, or if they should keep it around a lot longer. Semi-automated process helps keep our learning catalog free of irrelevant <coughs> and obsolete content. The demand dashboard also provides a variety of interactive reports based on the learning interest metric we discussed earlier. It also surfaces other key information about the learning activity, such as the number of enrollments, the average rating and number of raters, how often users select the learning activity from search, and quite a bit more. Portfolio owners can also see all the learning activities in their portfolio sorted by interest level. For traditional and live virtual classroom learning, this helps them gauge how often the course should be scheduled. All right, web analytics. We also use Uniconet Insight to capture web metrics on hundreds of sites within IBM, including learning sites. We made it as easy as possible for each of the learning sites to enable our web metric solution. And this gave us a consistent source of web metrics data for every learning site inside IBM. All right, so we ended up with executive level learning web metrics reports that have all sorts of information publicly available to any IBM employee, especially learning professionals. Um, these reports show overall uh, unique visitors, visits, and page views. Um, it also shows daily web traffic trends breaks down the traffic by job category and business unit, and even by country. We can even see the browsers, operating systems, time of day, and, um, and other details about the, when people are accessing learning, who's accessing the learning, and how. Okay. We can also see the learning web traffic broken down by site. And top learning sites can rightfully use this data to demonstrate their ongoing relevance, and sites that remain near the bottom of this list have every reason to be nervous. <laughs> it's hard to justify funding for a site if it's not being used. You can also see how the site traffic changes from month to month. And so these sites are available for all IBM learning, but in addition, they're available for specific learning sites and sections within each site. So all of the detail you saw there could be looked at at the site level as well. Um, and this helps um, them guide future page, de page decisions, future site decisions. And um, some examples of what we found is that site, uh, pages that provide learning recommendations don't get as much traffic as you might think. People ignore that, go straight to search. So what that told us is we need to focus more on search. Um, we've also found that users hardly ever go to help. If they get stuck, they give up, and they go somewhere else. Um, it also provides some interesting insight in how site design influences user behavior. For example, on the IBM Competencies website, the web metrics report showed that the Embrace Challenge competency consistently received more web traffic than other competency sections. It wasn't immediately clear why this would be the case, but when we looked at the web page, um, we found it was simply because the Embrace Challenge competency was at the top of the list. 
<laughs> so we updated the site so that different, competen different competencies took the top spot at different times, and lo and behold, the traffic's now more evenly distributed between the competencies. All right, so Webmetrics tells us how a learning site is being used, but not if the users are happy with this fact. Um, for this, we implemented a learning feedback widget. This widget is, a widget, so a widget's just a piece of code that's easy to reuse on different web pages. And with our feedback widget, users can simply click yes or no to indicate if they found the current page helpful or not. And this yes or no value is recorded, and the user is also given the option to type in a comment to supplement their response. So we found that about 1% of our users will actually click the button, and about 15% of those will actually type in a response. So it's a small fraction of, this, of the uh, overall site, but if you think about 70 million page hits, that's still a lot of feedback. In um, 2011, we received 18,500 uh, feedbacks on various learning web pages. These requests are sent to a database, um, one for reporting and one for tracking the comments so that we can follow up if there's any issues or really good suggestions that we get from our users. And so what this allows us to do is prioritize again what's important to the user, where is the user getting confused that we would have never realized, and so we get some surprisingly small modifications to websites and web applications that make a huge difference for our users. All right, learning dashboard. This is where I wanted to give the grand finale and provide a beautiful demo. Unfortunately, I'm not able to hook up my computer to the page, so you'll just have to use your imagination. <laughs> um, so we built this tool called Build, and it stands for Business Unit Insights Learning Dashboard. And what it provides, we have about 60, 70, no, actually 80 million rows of data on um, various learning activities when a user enrolls in a learning activity, completes the activity, and whatnot. And we consolidated that in aggregate down to about six million rows of data, and we loaded it into this tool so that learning professionals could get real-time reporting on learning activities. And not only that, we integrated the learning data with our HR um, dashboard, I'm sorry, our HR uh, data warehouse, so that we could, for a given demographic or for a given audience, we could show how many employees are in that demographic, how much learning they consumed, how much that learning cost, how, much, how often there were no-shows, and how much that no-show cost. And um, we can start slicing and dicing that data by geography, by business unit, by organization, by manager status, whether or not they're sellers, um, and about 50 other attributes. So what that produced is almost an infinite number of reports um, we provide reports in a spreadsheet format. We provide them in some nice scatter plots. And even more, when you look at a particular learning portfolio, for example, or it's view a report by learning portfolio, you can select that portfolio and you get a drill down and you see the learning actions that have occurred specifically in that portfolio, broken down by learning activity, broken down by job category, by country, whatever else. And further, you can drill down even farther and get all the details around the learning activity. What that gave us is unprecedented power to not only understand how much of the learning is being used, but portfolio owners and learning activity owners can actually drill down to their specific information, and they can even filter that. So they, they, they want to say, how is this course being used in, in GBS in China? They get a very clear answer, and they get all sorts of other information about how that audience breaks down by geo, by job category, and then whatever else. So I apologize, um, we can't show that. Trust me, it's impressive. <laughs> oh well. Um, so, one of the things that went into the dashboard was a really, really good book by an author named Stephen Few on uh, data visualization. The book's called uh, Information Dashboard Design. And if you guys have any interest on um, data visualization or reporting, I highly recommend this book. He ties together uh, user experience, 
taught um, cognitive science and um, technology and comes up with some really solid recommendations for uh, dashboard reporting. So the last thing I'm going to talk about is uh, predictive learning analytics. As, um, we're using it. Um, because I'm sure many of you have heard of SDSS, <coughs> given that um, it has a strong history in um, academic circles. Well, we've started using that. We're actually in the process, so I don't have uh, any major reporting to uh, show you. But what we're doing here is, is taking a look at the business impact of learning programs. So for example, we have a very large new hire program. IBM hires tens of thousands of employees every year. And at most of those employees participate in at least one of the five new employee experience programs that IBM offers. Um, and so the question is, are those programs actually making a difference? And, and today we are doing lots of traditional evaluation Patrick, level one, level two, level three type data. Um, but what we're doing with SPSS is actually looking, is there a correlation? Is taking one or more of these new employee experience programs a predictor that the IBMer is more likely to stay with IBM, that they're not gonna voluntarily leave? Are they more likely to get a promotion sooner? Are they more likely to get a stronger performance review? And so, we gather the HR data, we gather participation rates in these programs, and we can actually perform a scientific um, study on whether or not there's a strong correlation between participation in the program and certain business outcomes. All right. So, so the question is, you know, we, with web analytics, a key part of this is enabling the analytics on a web page or for a particular uh, web widget or whatever else. And so how do you use that specifically for learning? And um, there's, a, there's a few answers to that. For web pages, it's not much different than any other web page. But what we've done is, we, you, you saw the, um, I, don't, I, I didn't demo this, but one, we have a lot of widgets to display, to make learning activities available on any web page. So um, we call that the IBM Learning Card. And so these are widgets that actually can be easily embedded on any web page and, and make it easy to surface learning information in a standard way anywhere on the IBM website or on IBM intranet. And so those widgets are also enabled with this Unica tagging so that even if it's on a non-learning web page, we're able to track when users are viewing a particular learning activity, and um, the learning card actually, if it's um, non courseroom based learning, if it's like a video or an audio or a PDF, we actually display the learning within the context of the learning card, and we can track if they're actually consuming the learning. So they can then mark it complete or rate it and whatever else, and all of that can be tracked via um, Unica Web Analytics as well. So there's lots of opportunities to kind of uh, more than just web pages, the, the web analytics techniques that are used for web pages can be used for more than just web pages. Um, another thing we do um, to generate learning demand on key programs is have big email campaigns. And um, these email campaigns are nice, but there's most groups have not bothered finding out if the email campaign, campaign actually made a difference. So what you can do is, update the links in that campaign with a couple URL parameters, and what that tells Unica is, treat this link as part of an email campaign. And so a lot of the reports I showed you earlier can also be generated for a specific email campaign. So you can see overall how much traffic did this email campaign generate, um, what, where did the links originate, what types of users are using it, 
when are they going there, and, and things like that. Did that answer your question, or? Yeah, I think it's a, a big area. Yeah, it, 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 yeah, it is, a, it is a very big area, and really the possibilities are, are kind of endless. Um, any other questions? Do you have a measure of the user's proficiency level? Like, do you tie that to the recommendations you make? For example, someone who has five years of experience in a particular language or skill may benefit from something, whereas someone else may not, uh, you know, even though that's the type of program, for example. Yeah, okay, so, so the question is, do we have a measure of user's proficiency level in various skills or competencies or whatever else? And can we do recommendations based on um, those particular facts? And the answer is yes. Um, I, I didn't include that in this deck. Um, that is a project another person on my team has been working on, but that does exist. And so we have um, um, a, a number of tools. We, we, we track um, employee skills at a fairly granular level. We track about 5,000 different skills. But we also have um, nine big competencies, and each of those we track levels in as well. And, and the competencies are almost like a certification process to go through to, to, to move up. And for each of these skills and competencies, we can provide learning recommendations. So we look at that person's particular competency and skill profile, and learning can be tagged for that particular competency. Um, some other ways we're doing recommendations is we actually just look at what types of things the user is accessing. We look at the web analytics, and we look at people who have also visited similar things to them. And so we look at, if they have a strong overlap, we say, okay, you guys have a lot in common, but we see this guy visited this and you didn't, so you might also be interested in this. And so we can get really smart about, instead of requiring everything to be manually tagged by a learning professional, dynamically recommend it based on um, people with similar uh, interests in, in particular topics. Yes. If you uh, measure the relative value or outcome value of the different learning methodologies that you have, you know, online, classroom, etc. Okay, so the question is, have we measured the various um, methodologies? Have we, is there online learning more effective than classroom learning or vice versa? Um, the short answer is, yeah, we do a lot of learning effectiveness measures. That's not something I feel comfortable talking about simply because there's a whole other group that does nothing but that. Mm. And um, what I, I can say that we have been slowly but surely reducing the number of classrooms, yeah. increasing the number of e-learning, live virtual classroom, and we're actually increasing the use of what we're calling informal learning. And that's simply learning from a social perspective. We have a tool called the Informal Learning Exchange. And through that tool, anybody in IBM can find anything on the IBM internet or anything on the internet, such as a YouTube video or a really good TED, TED video or a really good technology blog. And they can add that to the informal learning exchange. And that makes it available to anybody else in IBM. And that has a lot of good things. Uh, there, we, basically, IBM gets that learning for free. Um, and even within IBM, Somebody may post it to a, uh, a social networking site within IBM or a file sharing site, but they don't necessarily flag it as learning because they just think, well, this is stuff that I work on. Somebody else can come along and say, that's really good learning, add it to the ILX, and now when somebody is looking for learning, they can find that piece of, particular piece of content along with our formal learning offer. Um, so, what is live virtual learning? A, li a live virtual classroom is simply um, learning that is led by an instructor a lot like in a classroom setting, but you don't actually have a class. Everybody sits in front of their computer. There's, there's, yeah, so there's like either video transfer or simply screen sharing transfer. Everybody's either doing audio over the um, computer or audio over phone, and so you can essentially have an interactive classroom without everybody being in the same room. And so we have moved more towards e-learning, live virtual classroom and other things. Um, so far, it's been relatively effective. Um, for the larger programs, um, such as the Global Sales School and the New Employee Experience Program, we do still have some components that are classroom-based, even though a lot of them are moving away. So there'll maybe be one classroom session for a few days, and then everything else is done um, remotely. Are, are 
Video is, video is huge. Um, and what's cool about video is that we can actually start off by keeping it simple, just have an audio track. But if it gets really popular, we can add in captions so that it's easier to read um, or e easier to follow. And we can also add in captions for different languages. So a lot of IBMers, English is not their first language, so it's nice to be able to read the captions in their native language while they're watching the video. Regarding the new user experience, uh, the new new employee experience uh, metrics that you've run, what would you say are the aspects of that that are most highly correlated with things like retention, engagement, and things like that? Yeah. Okay. So for the new employee experience program, um, what have we found that correlates? And, and the answer is, I'll tell you in a couple months. <laughs> <laughs> so we're right in. We're literally right in the middle of performing that study. I'm really excited about it. I think it has a lot of potential. Uh, what we're actually doing, though, is controlling for a lot of other attributes. So, where the person's hired, what organization they're in, what their job role is, um, what, what their uh, salary band happens to be, all of those have a big influence. We already know those have a big influence on things like attrition rate. And so, what we're doing is actually controlling for all those and saying, all these other factors considered is participation in this program a predictor of, of that particular business outcome. And, and what's really nice about that approach is that no, it's, it's objective data. It's not a survey that somebody can say, oh well, they just, they just said what you wanted to hear, or that's just their opinion. They didn't, you know, they may have said that, but they're going to leave anyway. <clears throat> um, this is fact. This is, either they left or they didn't. And, and so it, it really ties and, and, and things like attrition have a real business impact to IBM. Um, it costs a lot of money to hire somebody, to go through the process of hiring somebody and then have them leave a year later. So anything we can do that can show a reduction in that saves IBM money and shows real value for the learning program. Yes? I'm part of that 25% of it is in the school and not in the corporate world. I'm a PhD student at TCU right now. In the school that I worked at, uh, we collect about a million data points a month of student learning at a preschool for children with autism. And our teachers are trained in a decision algorithm to make decisions on student learning based off of like the last five days. However, we have all these data points that are going unanalyzed for years. Um, and it's been my goal to try to figure out how we could develop an algorithm to learn the student and to be able to make more effective decisions and actions based off that data. And I understand that what you're going over is web learning and off the websites, but are there areas in which you could recommend or where I should look to address analytics in that, in that way? Yeah. Okay, so, and, and first up, it sounds like your school's ahead of the game in actually capturing all this data. So even if it's not being processed now, at least you have it for historical purposes right. so that you can begin to, when you do get around to analyzing it, you have a historical context so you can see how things are changing, if they're changing at all. Um, my, my initial reaction is, is that you can do a couple things. Um, one is SPSS is really good at just doing some comparative analysis and, and all sorts of very complex you know, statistical schemes. Um, you can also look at some tools IBM provides. I, I recommend getting some form of analytical software, it is the short answer. Um, two, two from IBM that come to mind are SPSS and uh, Cognos. Um, and there's a new tool uh, that Cognos just came out with called Cognos Insight. And um, that makes some of these data visualizations I've been um, talking about much, uh, much easier to produce. Um, through the front.
So, so two questions. One, the, the, I'll answer the second question first because I think it's easier. Um, does IBM provide consulting services in the education field? Um, and, and is that available to uh, learning institutions? And, and the short answer is yes. Um, since we're internal, I, I can't articulate too much about it. I do have some contacts. We, a lot of the stuff I've shared with you, we've shared with them. And some of this they will use in sales pitches and, and whatnot. Um, so if you want to give us your name, I might be able to get you in contact with somebody. Um, and remind me of the second question. Just my question is, how, how will you, if you find something like you're generating more yeah, demand okay. than you actually, in, the use of volume is coming right. to you and saying, this is an application you need. And so you're, you're talking about how do we generate end user demand? Yes. Okay, so, and the second is how do we generate end user demand for learning? And do we, you know, one of the first things we did when we started really getting into this analytics game was we thought if we only provided users the right recommendations, everything would be good. And so we came up with all sorts of complex schemes to provide recommendations. And we still provide recommendations. But what we found with Webmetrics is that most people just ignore the recommendations. When they go to a learning site, they know what they're looking for, and they're going to go to search, or they're going to go to the navigation, and they're going to find it. Um, or if they don't, they're just going to leave the site. They're not going to trust the recommendations, or they're just not going to pay attention to them. What we found is they just don't even see them. Um, what, what does work, one, is make sure search works very well. And two, things like email campaigns. People pay attention to their email to this day. You know, We're moving into a social networking world, and we're moving into instant messaging and a lot of other things. And we use all of that within IBM. But people read their mail. So if you do an email campaign right, you can't flood their inbox, and the email when they open it has to actually be interesting. But what we found is that an email campaign done right generates strong learning demand. Um, the, t the format, and, and with analytics, you can know was the email campaign successful or not, so you can play around with different formats and kind of refine your technique till you actually find one that works. And what we found works especially well is the email itself is very simple. It has a really good teaser, maybe even has an image that looks that lets you see there's a video. They click on that, it takes them to a web page that plays a short, maybe five minute video, and at the end of that video, they get a little prompt that says, go learn more. And so they kind of get sucked into the learning process through an engaging, uh, friendly um, email. You're suggesting that people can learn things from other people. <laughs> and, and the answer is absolutely. And, and especially in a big company like IBM, because I guarantee you, if you have a question, there's somebody in that mix that's going to know the answer. Um, and and we're, we're actually using, we're actually looking at ways to connect people as well as learning material. Um, one example is on that informal learning exchange site I was telling you about. When a user performs a search, we not only display the informal learning that matches their search, but on the sidebar, we show people who match that search. So there's an entirely different group that has applications around expertise location. And so um, they, they've created entire systems. One, we have an application called Blue Pages, which is just an in, internal directory. So if you know the name of somebody or you want to see how they report up, whatever, you can just type in the name and quickly find it. But a layer on top of that is this expertise location system. And what that tracks is people's skills in very specific ways. Some of it is gathered automatically by virtue of what they've posted on blogs or wiki pages within IBM. Um, and some of it's manually updated. They can voluntarily join particular groups that support on a particular topic. So it just says, reach out to me if. And, um, what happens is that we can then use the APIs provided by, by that application to service people as well as learning. Now there's also a tool in IBM, it's, a, it's 
one of the fastest growing tools that we're selling right now, and that's called IBM Connections. And, and IBM Connections is essentially Facebook for organizations. So it's an internal, you know, in, on your intranet. It's not public to everyone, but it's, it's a way for organizations, especially medium to large organizations, to have, have the Facebook experience. So we have, everybody has their, you know, their, their profile. You can have your own blog, you can have your own wiki. What a really big feature of connections is communities. And so you have, anybody can create a community space. A lot of them simply don't go anywhere. They, they die within a day of being born. But some of them really take off and end up with thousands of users and you end up with this really dynamic, interactive space where people on a, with passion on a particular topic can go and get information they need. Um, an example is, you know, there's a small but growing number of uh, IBMers that use a MacBook. So there's a MacBook community within IBM on how do we get ourselves set up to the network, what's the software we can use, if we gotta run Windows, how do we do that? And, and it's a great place because somebody solved the problem that you're running into and you just post a question and, and usually within an hour, at least within a day, somebody's gonna give you an answer. Um, all right, next. First question is, what's the incentive for IBMers to learn at all? And, and what's the incentive to learn within the IBM walled garden called our internet? Um, the answer to the first question is, um, all right, so my undergraduate degree was in computer science and software engineering. And what one of my professors told me is that everything you learn right now is gonna be obsolete in five years. Um, so that's why you have to learn. If you want to keep a job, if you want to be relevant in five years, you have to keep learning. Otherwise, you're just going to become obsolete. So everybody has a professional incentive to stay on top of what's going to be relevant. IBM makes money because customers come to us because we're on the forefront of technology. So if we don't stay on the forefront of technology, we stop providing, we stop providing value to our customers and we go out of business. So, so that's, that's the incentive for IBMers to learn. So why learn internally versus externally? And, and the short answer is IBMers learn any way they can. I have to say probably the majority of, of times when I have a question, one of the first things I'll do is I'll just go out and do a Google search. And a lot of times I'll find specific answers to my questions there. Um, there's definitely you know, specific IBM products, um, professional development programs, and other things that IBM provides internally. Um, now, a lot, all the metrics I showed you were about internal learning. So stuff that IBM offers internally, we know, but have a very difficult time tracking all the other learning that just kind of happens informally outside of that. Um, now, we do also have programs like the program I'm in that IBM is paying for my degree at Teachers College. And it's called the Academic Learning and Assistance <coughs> program. And they also pay for professional development and other programs um, that are, uh, you know, maybe even a week long or whatever else. So, so IBM does fund external learning as well as internal learning, but a lot of learning is just available free on the internet. So it's not the case that like your records on Unico would be part of your performance review? Um, so the question is, no, no. The records on Unico are actually, we, we have a pretty strong privacy policy. So we capture a lot of data about people, but there's a zero tolerance policy. And actually, in most cases, unless you're the administrator of the system, you can't even build reports for an individual level. Um, some of the learning completions in the formal learning, like the manager can see, uh, a learning portfolio owner can see, but the vast majority of people within IBM, including learning professionals, we take privacy very seriously. Um, okay, yes? All right, so what, what learning analytics can a manager see for an employee? Um, we, ha we have a tool for managers within IBM called the, uh, the, the 
yeah, the, man the manager portal. <laughs> um, and, um, and, and what that does is it provides all sorts of information about their employees. Um, one of the things that they can see from there is they can go in and they can actually see the learning history of things that the learners actually enrolled in and completed, and that can be helpful for the performance review. Um, when they apply for, like I mentioned the competencies framework model. So we have a lot of people such as consultants and project managers will request to be moved from a, a lower level on a particular competency to say that they've gone from acquired this competency to master. And to do that, they have to provide evidence that they demonstrated work on the job, that they've got adequate learning, that basically they can work at that higher level. And so there's actually a formal review process where they document everything they've done, and, that, and included in that can be both formal learning as well as other things they've done, such as just read a book they got from Amazon or, or whatever else. Yes? This is, this is pretty impressive. I haven't seen anything like this in any of the companies that I've worked for, and certainly not the company that I've worked for now. How simple or complex is it to incorporate Unica into a current learning management system to a current environment that's that existing? Yeah, okay, so how, how difficult is it to set up uh, Unica in a, in a if, we, if we don't have any web metrics already? Um, I, I don't want to oversell it. It, it, you know, there is a little bit of setup and a little bit of planning you have to do. The, the biggest thing is like, you wanna make sure that the pages get automatically tagged so that you get not only this person hit this page, but this page is part of this section, which is part of this subsection and whatnot. So there's a little bit of planning, but at the end of the day, you're just adding an HTML JavaScript tag to the page and that basically handles everything. So there's nothing on the server other than the little HTML tag that you add um, that, that you have to set up. You don't have to set up a software internally. Um, this is basically software as a service, which means all of those messages get sent to the Unica servers out in the cloud. You know, it's secure. It's, it's not gonna be compromised by anybody, but um, there's no system set up on your side. There's a licensing fee that you have to pay for Unica itself, but once you do that, it's just a matter of enabling it on your site. All right, two more questions. One in the back, and then I saw one here. If you had a magic wand and could pick any um, data points that you aren't currently measuring, yeah. what would you pick? <laughs> All right, so if I had my kudos, uh, what would I do? Um, I'm really, really excited about this intersection between learning and HR and other business metric outcomes. So tying together the learning with, say, seller quota attainment, you know, or tying together learning with consultant utilization rate, or performance reviews, or whatever else. Whatever the learning, you know, any learning IBM provides, in theory at least, it provides value to the business. So they should be able to say, well, what is that value, and how would we measure that value? And so then, you know, and, and, and so this idea of showing hard evidence that at least it's a predictor, you know, you, you can argue whether cause and effect when you're, when you're dealing with statistics, but you can at least say there's something here. There's a strong correlation, there's a strong predictive relationship between taking this learning and seeing this business outcome. So I, I think that would be, you know, my favorite. Now in terms of starting, how would you get started? The, the best advice I have is start slow. Just one, make sure you're getting the data. Get, if you don't get the data, you're, you're, you can't even get started. Even if you can't analyze the data, it's a good idea to just gather the data and let it sit until somebody or someone can get around to actually analyzing it. Uh, but then just focus on visualizing the data. Build some reports, make that data available to as many people as possible, and just that, just getting the facts, has a huge impact on the culture of decision making within your organization because it's no longer, speak, it's no longer about politics or buzz or what what the man upstairs wants, you can ground your decisions in actual data, and, and that makes that, that makes all the difference. Um, I recently saw the Ray Kurzweil documentary, Transcendent Man, are you familiar with it? I don't think I've seen that. So these, uh, uh, Sergey Brin is on, oh, the, the interface, between, when you look at the interface between oh, they, they, ourselves, how we're merging with technology. Used to be that we had to put punch cards in. Yeah, now yeah. we hold in our right. hands. So the, the, the human, human computer interface. Yes. Do, is there anybody in IBM working on this? <laughs> um, I, and IBM has 
a very, very large research organization. Right. Um, I'm sure there's some stuff in there. One, one thing that's kind of like that is the Watson um, software that you guys have heard about on Jeopardy. And what that's really good at is, one, voice recognition, but two, interpreting the question and actually finding a reasonable answer. Mm -hmm. And that's huge because you know, they're, they're talking about doing this with doctors. So you know, a doctor can talk or type or whatever else. You get the list of symptoms and boom, you know, the doctor can still make their own decision, but they get insight from a Watson computer that's really good at medicine. Or they're talking about doing that with finance and, and other areas where you kind of get this collaborative relationship. You're not replacing the expert, but this becomes a tool for the expert to become much more productive and it's sort of a quality assurance check to make sure that the expert's decisions, if, if they get an answer that's different than what Watson recommends, not necessarily it's wrong, but you want to just double check again before it's right. So, sorry, I, 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 oh, pro you. the answer's probably yes, but I, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> All right, well, thank you much. Thank you.